All right, this is No Excuses with Michael D. Leonardo. I'm your host, RJ Roger. We hit 10,000. <laughs> it took us about three and a half months. <laughs> Michael, how you doing, brother? All right, I want to congratulate everybody for getting us there. The congratulations is on them. It's yeah. uh, They got us there. Absolutely. I really appreciate. Um, I want to show. I want to wish everybody and their families happy Thanksgiving. Also, uh, so thank you again, and uh, we celebrate you today, all you people out there. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, just to, uh, so I was on. As everybody knows, I started out on Black Hand Print, and you know, and that's how I met Michael. We developed our friendship um, by being on that, being uh, just by us meeting as a result of my black, um, that show, sorry. Um, so there was never no original plans for us to ever, I don't even think we ever even talked about him coming on my show or us uh, ever partnering up on the show until, man, it would have to, I would say a couple months before we even had a conversation about anything. Um, so then, you know, we just developed a friendship first and then continued to talk. And then at some point I brought it up to him and yeah, he was 50-50 at first and we continued to talk. So here we are today starting the show. Um, it was nerve wracking, I'll be honest at first. And, you know, it was something new for me. Uh, I was never a, a host of a show. You know, it was a learning curve. Look at some of our earlier shows. I was a little long winded sometimes. Uh, some of my questions were a little, you know, uh, too lengthy, um, but it was, a learning experience, you know, um, some comments, I didn't like all of them, but they helped me um, and they still helped me. I think it'll make me a better host. Um, it was different to go from being, writing an entire show and presenting an entire show to kind of yielding in the background, um, trying not to speak over 25% of the time on the show, yielding to Michael, but trying to come up with good questions and things like that. So, um, it was a, a different role, but I enjoy this show. This has been um, fun, and that's always most important in content is to have fun. It's fun. Um, I met more people. Uh, you know, it's helped. Uh, it's been helpful for Michael, helpful for me. So, and then also there was a little bit of pressure on me to make sure that <laughs> the show is successful, right? So um, I can't sit next to... Mikey scars and fail, right? <laughs> so, um, and also, like me and Michael always talk about privately, I'm aware that, you know, he's the star of the show. I've never kidded myself about that. I'm the opening act that people feel like he gets in the way of the guy I showed up to watch. So this show has had, it's, um, you know, it was a learning curve for me, but um, uh, everyone on this show, 98% of the time has been encouraging to me, has helped us to build the show. You guys have shared the show with your friends. You guys have left positive comments, positive feedback. I could never thank you enough hitting this, you know, first initial milestone of 10,000 um, is I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, it took us about three months to get there. Um, and we did it organically, independently. We did it without we didn't make show appearances. We didn't do promotion. We didn't go nowhere. We didn't get any support from any other channels. For the most part, there was only one channel that ever since we've been on here endorsed us. Um, that was um, Jeff Nadeau with the sit down. He's the only guy that ever shared us, talked about us, directed us following to come to us. But by and large, we were grassroots. We, we did this just uh, with ideas and just putting out, trying to put out the best content. So that's my opening statement. I, uh, this is about you guys. This is a viewer centric channel. This was always about you. Um, we took the, the positives with the negatives. Um, and I just want everybody to know that um, without the viewer, there's no uh, channels. There's no content. There's no reason to make anything. So I'm always a little bit uh, concerned when I see creators um, F -ing their viewers. In my opinion, it doesn't matter what you say or what your opinion is. You are the person that gives us the ability to have a show. Um, our show is about you. We appreciate you. Um, 
So I just want to say thank you for helping us get to this point, helping us reach 10,000 subscribers. Um, you know, our shows have been successful. We've got good views. We got good comments. We got good feedback. So thank you. And um, I hope you guys stick with us. Our YouTube show, as far as where we're going in the future, will stay the same. You know, we'll continue to be on YouTube. Um, we'll continue to put out content on YouTube. We are doing some work on Patreon where you got some different type of stories, um, more detailed stories. Uh, that show is more Michael uh, and just telling stories about his time in the Gambino family. Uh, we have a great show that's tentatively scheduled to come out tomorrow on the um, December 12th, 1989 transcripts um, above the Ravenite. Uh, Michael's analyzing these tapes line by line. He's given his assessment on what uh, this discussion means between Frank Lucasio and John Gotti. So um, if you're interested in, hear in, in hearing this, uh, Michael's breakdown of this, join our Patreon. That show will be up tomorrow. Um, so that's all I got for on my end. Um, this show will take questions from you guys. We'll bring you guys in. If you want to come in, I'll drop a link. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this initial, this initial milestone for us. Um, um, overjoyed, grateful. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. And with that, I'll pass it to Michael. Well, just to follow up on RJ, uh, some of his points is uh, when you make suggestions, we hear it. We hear you. There's been a lot of things about a lot of people and they don't go unnoticed. We just can't get to everybody all at once. We're trying to have some kind of semblance of keeping the show in a direction. We would love to talk about everybody all at once, but you, you just can't do that. It'll get lost. So we're trying to break it down and be as precise and detailed, at least I am in my answers to RJ's questions. Uh, so we want your input. Don't ever feel funny about input because that helps us create a show or a narrative. Or it, at times, there's been people that it opened up my mind to something I forgot. So it was or something I didn't think should be in the show or be talked about. So uh, it, keep it coming. I love the suggestions. It's got some very smart people out there, very bright, and uh, got some intellects that are highly, highly educated. I don't know who they are, but at times they come on and they, they do add a lot to the show and it puts me in a different perspective on how I have to think. And uh, it's, it, it's like an exercise and it's well, well received by me and, and by RJ. Now, RJ's questions. If you ever want, and I didn't talk to him about this. If you ever want RJ to ask me a tough question or something that you think we're avoiding, we're not avoiding anything. The people that after I was off the street, I don't know about them. I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not going to guess. These people have their freedom. They're doing whatever they do. I don't know what they're doing, and I'm not going to guess it. I don't think that would be fair. But if you have a tough question to RJ, because most times he don't share with me what he's going to ask me. I've said this before. But if you have a tough question, uh, question for me, pose it to him. He won't give you up. So, uh, and this is what this is about. I want the tough questions. I want to let people know that are here to enjoy our show. And if there's something they need to learn about a situation or about a person, uh, as far as I can say it, I will. And I'm going to be fair. I'm going to be down the road with the people I talk about, even the people I loved in that life, liked in that life, respected in life, looked up to in that life. Um, People I didn't like in that life, that I thought there were a, a different type of person, not for that life. Not that I'm the judge of all. It's just my perception of these people. I'm going to give them a fair shake. If I talk negatively, negatively about somebody, it won't be because of my personal feelings to them. I will divorce myself from those feelings and tell you the stories. I will going to be as pragmatic as I possibly can. And I want you to take me to task, like I said in the book, in the past, on anything that I say. Because you will have questions. After I say stories, they're gonna be in conflict, not in concert at times with other 
YouTube people or people who wrote books and movies and whatever they're doing. Uh, there's times that we all see the world a little differently. You know, one time I was a grain of sand on the beach and I watched big boulders being moved around to people in higher positions. I sat back and watched from a kid. Two ears, one mouth. So I seen a lot, even after I was inducted into that life. I still wanted to be underestimated, under the radar as much as possible. But I was fortunate enough to have people in major positions throughout my life to fight me. Trust me. I broke some of the trust when I cooperated. But we're going to just put it in the time frame that I'm telling these stories. And these events, as I like to call them, in the proper place. Of course, there is a lot of history that's distorted. I'll let you be the judge of their stories and mine. And hopefully at times we can have parallels and ride down the same roads together with these stories and, and, and corroborate history. But sometimes it don't, don't go that way. Or we human beings see the world differently and see people differently. Because somebody hates somebody in life doesn't mean I have to, because we're all friends. That's not the way life works in that life or any other life. You know, the enemy of your enemy could be my friend. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's part of that life. I'll talk about the tests that you go through. A lot of tests go over people's heads. But the people that give the test on their character and mindset uh, far and few between today. Uh, years ago, the people I got uh, reared by and educated by, those are the people that did those things. And I'll share some of them, some, of them, some funny stories uh, and some of them, some powerful stories that you get life lessons that you need to use later on in life. Uh, most of the stuff that you learn in the street is applicable to daily life. If anybody ever wants to talk, I got a nice psychiatrist or a psychologist. But if anybody wants to talk about life issues, we'll have an audience for that one day. If it comes to that point where people just want to chat about other things besides the mob. If we get enough requests, requests for that, I'm amenable to it. Again, I'm not, I'm not looking for anybody to put, bring out a couch. Not for that. But uh, I, I, I like interacting with people and I can help with guidance on some issues. And you respect my opinion, I'm here. And uh, I want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. And like I said, most important thing here is, and you've heard it from every YouTube person or any anybody who has a show or TV or anywhere else, they want you to be engaged. And they want you to be here because it builds their, their channel and their brand bigger. Make no mistake about it. It's about the people that are doing this. We want to get bigger. The bigger we get, the more we feel we accomplish something without tricking anybody. We're not going to lie to you. Catch me in a lie or a mistake or I misspoke. Take us to task. But this is what it's about. We want to get bigger. And when this ends and there's, you get bored of us, we go about our merry ways. And we, but we have history in its place that this could be watched forever, whoever was interested. We're getting calls by and Texas right now by somebody from Georgetown University. We're getting professors, and maybe he's a professor, we're going to call him back. We're getting people interested to hear our theory on life issues and street issues, because it is applicable to business. These models that we built, when I say we, this cause and Austria that goes back, it's a business model. It's a business plan. So just that sometimes the results are a little different. Uh, but again, it's a cutthroat business and regular businesses and corporations. Uh, I think they take our advice. And I give a shout out to a guy like Fred, Michael Francesi. He does well with that. The guy's a great, great orator. He's pragmatic and he's straightforward. And he has a good mind. So, uh, and that's the lines that we want to be. So with that, I'll turn it over to RJ again, and uh, all you people, if you have any questions, we're here. Let it go. Yeah, and just to piggyback one thing that Michael said, so questions. 
it's never a question. You can see in the comments, because even in comments that have been left where there's been tough questions left to Michael or questions that could be viewed as an insulting question, Michael answers them. He answers every question on the board, positive or negative. He always says, there's, there's been a couple of times I blocked somebody for a question. He, RJ, don't do that. Leave him on. I'll answer it. So um, now my job is not is to open doors in Michael's mind. That's all my job on here is. It ain't to make him look like an asshole. It ain't to sit here and debate and fight and argue. It is to open him up. That's all my job is. He says something because you'll hear him say all the time. That just knocked the rust off. And whenever I get that, that tells me, ah, that's a good one. <laughs> so um, my job as the host is to bring Michael out of himself, to get him to the closest place where he's telling you a good story and he's getting, he's digging inside of himself. So um, uh, we want, again, so we welcome all tough questions. Now, I also want to bring on, uh, I see some people in the back room. I was, um, uh, Mikey Jr. will also be joining us here shortly. Um, so, um, and I, so what I'll do is I'm going to bring on some people who are, who, who are, who are here and then we'll get into the, the live chat and, um, answer some of your questions that you guys have there. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, looks like I have Pat here. Um, now guys, real quick, like I always say, um, please, um, be mindful that there could be other people who want to come in. So let's try it and keep it. And, um, you know, we don't, you know, come on, say what you want to say, ask your questions. And then if I got to cut you off, please don't take it as though I'm being respectful. And Pat, I see you in the back. Before I bring you on, I want to bring on Mike uh, Jr. very quickly. Um, hey, Mikey. What's up, boys? What's going on? Hey, I'm glad you got to make it on. I know you might want to, you know, say thank you or say some things for, you know, us hitting our, like I said before, guys, Mikey is as involved in this channel as I am and as uh, Michael is. We all work together. We, we talk about things. We plan shows together. We put questions together. We all work. We all have a role here. So, um, big day, Michael. We, I mean, Mikey, we hit 10,000. Yeah. <clears throat> Finally hit on Mark, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good First day. Mark. Yeah. Took a little bit. We got there. Exactly. Stay the course. Uh, man, what's going on? Where'd you get that haircut? I didn't get a haircut. That's the problem. <laughs> wow, it's really cropped. What do you got on? Oh, it's a hat. It's a hat. You uh, thought that was my hair? Yeah, I got my glasses on. It is oh, my hair. Right. I better leave the hair up. Throw the hat away. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to be here. Sorry I'm late. No, it's no problem. I know you guys have been going all day long. Yeah, it's been a long day. Planning. Yeah, you really feel tired? No, that's what we do. Yeah. We're naturals. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Who are you bringing on? I seen you uh, bringing on Pat. Yeah, I'm gonna bring on Pat here. Hey, bring him on. All right. Hey, look at this, Mikey. How are you? All right, Pat. Excuse, excuse the voice. It's a little hoarse. Um, how's everything? How's the family? Happy Thanksgiving. You too. You and your family. I'm, I never met the son. Good looking guy. Thank you. Oh, Pleasure. Jim. Pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, just let me introduce myself. I'm John's brother. Oh, I mean, all right. <laughs> yeah, nobody. I, I see, mean, nobody. Yeah, I see really you Mikey knows, but uh, right. just to introduce myself. But I got a little quick question. Uh, yeah. Not to do with the neighborhood. Now, I grew up in that neighborhood along with you, my brother. And, you know, that element was always around. Um, but it was. You know, I don't understand people. I never saw the violent part of that. And it was always um, a respectful thing. I mean, those people were part of the neighborhood. It wasn't, it, you know, maybe for you guys on the inside, it was a bad thing. But I think it really helped the neighborhood. But I was afraid for my brother because I really didn't like, you know, you know, it may be good for the neighborhood, but I don't want him, you know, near that. And John would always tell me, don't worry, I'm with Mikey, you know. And uh, he was a tough kid. Yeah. <laughs> but why, my question is, what did you see in him, you know, to, to let him, you know, hang around with you guys? Well, it goes back to something RJ and I talk about. We're going back into history. 
Yeah. What did everybody see in, in, in the people they brought up into that life? You know them when they're born. You watch them grow. You know who their family is. Mother, father, uncles, cousins. You watch them. And these are the things, the traits and the attributes they have that you know where they came from. You know, it's not a guy who just came around and he's a jewel thief and uh, you found a jewel thief climbing, a guy's 300 pounds climbing up buildings, robbing jewelry. Uh, and then you put, want to put him in the mob. You just came around because he's bringing money. No, of course not. Of you know, course not. What you, what you see in somebody, in a kid in the neighborhood, it's, it's a pedigree. <clears throat> you know he's capable. You watch it. You can see he can have a fight. You can see he can stand up in a fight. You see he's not running away. You see he don't call the cops. You see he don't tell a teacher. You see he don't become <laughs> God. These are all the things that you look for as an older guy in the neighborhood. He comes around the club. You see how he acts. You see how if he's respectful to other people. If he's if, he, if he, he's not a bully. You know, you know, you, even on the street, you say, oh, they marble one bullets. Yeah, you get them, but at the time they're expendable. But uh, you know, that's how that's the, what you see in somebody. And your brother, I have to like your brother. He was funny, he was tough, uh, he, he was very loyal. He, he, he liked to hang around. He, he was very comfortable because everything I just articulated, he grew up with us, so there was no, uh, oh, there's Mikey, oh, there's this this guy, there's Jackie. It was, it was natural because these are people you grow up with. So it's yeah, like, John, John's got a, John's got a, um, a personality. He's very, he's very, ca ca um, what's the word? I can't, my throat. Uh, charisma. He's got a lot of charisma. Yeah. Um, he's a funny guy, loyal. I wouldn't have a better brother than that. Um, I, you know, I, because me watching that, you know, we have two different personalities. Um, I kind of shied away from that. I like playing sports. I like the girls. Um, some other things that I don't want to mention, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just interesting to see that 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 whole transformation with him until the time where, um, you know, Jackie spoke to him and told him, I'm not a you, kid. And the only reason why I think he told him that was just to keep him safe. Yeah, 100%. It was over. A lot of things were yeah. over. There was Excellent. Uh, but one question before you go. Your mm -hmm. father was the opera singer, right? No, that was my brother's father-in-law. Your brother? That was John's father-in-law? Yes, and he was on the movie Big. Yeah. Um, um, about oh, was he? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, he, my brother, well, we lived, I mean, we were a tight family. We lived in the same house. So right. he would come over and he'd sing a little bit, you know. He would, And he worked for, I think, the restaurant in Manhattan, I think it was called Sardi's, where they oh, sung. Sure. Was it Sardi's or something else? I don't know. I'm not but sure. they had fingers for waiters. And well, it was right Broadway. Yeah, I used to be, yeah, he, right. He was, uh, he was pretty, very good, because I would be two houses away in Tommy's house in the backyard. And, yes. was, yeah, and I would say, come on, belt out an area for us. <laughs> he was good. One, Hello, and he would be singing first opera in the backyard. And it was yes, great. he was very, he was very good. He was very good. Well, anyway, I'm sure I'm going to hear from my brother for asking that question. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to know growing up. I mean, you know, uh, maybe one day I can tell you a couple of things that I got involved with when I was a kid. Um, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be very surprised. But that give our, neighborhood, Jay call, give, our, give our Jay a call and we'll get to it. Okay. Um, right. But that neighborhood, that neighborhood, oh, I, I, no, I'm not going to say it promoted it, but I mean, I hung out with a couple of guys and we were always looking to scheme. Travelers, checks, credit cards, um, whatever, you know, on a small scale. I thought that was legal. Uh, no, nah, well, we did. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, well, we did, but we had to tell you the truth, Mikey. We were so bad. We always used to lose our travelers' checks and credit cards all the time. We'd always have to report them stolen, you know. So, and uh, it was a it was profitable. <laughs> anyway, um, 
I'm glad to see Mikey. You look great. Good for you. Good for you. It's been a long time since I've seen you in the neighborhood. Yeah. RJ, great show. Thank Junior. you. Junior. Junior. Your dad was a great man. He's a good man. Good heart. Thank you. So keep that in mind. Thank you, Pat. Anyway, you got a whole crew behind me. Go get them, and I'm going to enjoy the show from the background. Thank you, Pat. Best regards. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, and Thank John, you, this way, let me tell my brother something. Don't tell no more lies. He got Johnny B. That name, that's Johnny Bullshit. He's got that name for a reason. <laughs> His stories get bigger and better all the time. All right, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the holidays. I'm out. Thank you. Take care, brother. You too. Yep. All right. Next up, I'm bringing on John Travellino. He's a regular here. He's. You might want to take an interest in the show, uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how you doing, guys? Good. You stopped smoking? No, I didn't stop. But salute, salute. for Fortuna. Congratulations. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, you and your family, John. You fit, you sound much better. Yeah, I feel much better. So, uh, you know, I was almost in tears after hearing my brother talk like that. But I never had to worry. Mikey always had me under his wing. Michael was the best, man. Um, you know, but um, I'm so happy for you guys. You guys deserve it. And uh, it's a great thing, man. It's a great thing. Well, look, John, you got to get healthy. That's number one. I, I, I know. I I'm, working it. I'm, work, I'm working on it. So now, uh, I got to correct your brother. At yeah. the end, he gave you a shot. He gave you what they call a bota. He gave you a little shot. Yeah. Well, what he did was he says you, you stressed the truth. I says, but he's a, I wanted to say he's a fisherman. The you know about the fish? I caught a fish this big. And it was this yeah, big. yeah. <laughs> So, well, uh, I got to clear up a couple of things. The, f the father-in-law, that's the ex-father-in-law, and he used to sing at Asties. Okay. So, and he was in the movie Big. He's the guy catching the dough in his mouth. He was a pain in my ass. Anyway. <laughs> he sang good, though. The guy was great. Yeah, he did. He did. He, he wounded it for himself. He was, he was on a radio show years ago, like, you know, Years and years ago, it was an Italian radio station. Yeah. He was called, uh, I think it was uh, WOV. I'm gonna guess, yes, WOV. yes, he was on that. He he used to stutter, so he he talked like a moron on that show, anyway. But I got new nicknames for you you're the deacon, Michael, and you're the reverend, RJ, <laughs> and Mikey Jr. I'm gonna call you Mikey Gugutz from now on. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but you know what his real name was. That was temporary, that name. Well, I know it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I'll let you take it out see what Michael said. I'll watch Michael when you say it. What was his real name? Mikey Meatballs. <laughs> Mikey Meatballs. Oh, I should have known better with the sword and everything. Know. Mikey <laughs> Meatballs. Forget Meatballs. You're going to be the good goods now. Yeah, my son the title. Goods. So, uh, you know, how how you guys doing? Everything's good. Yeah, Everything's pretty good. 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 Excellent. Excellent. And like, you know, he had me in tears, my brother. I, I never had a worry. I was always loyal to Michael and I always will be loyal to Michael and he knows it. And, uh, and I never had a worry. Never had a look behind my back. I never had to do any of that stuff because Michael is a stand up guy and I just gravitated to it. Like, you know, I knew it was like a, another family to me. Correct. That's right. You know, it was act, exactly like that. So, you know, who knows where I would have, you know. Well, you went to the Air Force. You did the right spot. You went to the Air Force. Yeah. But then when I came back out, I went back in and just hung out, you know. So, you know, you learn a lot of things in the Air Force. Oh, military. So, yeah, make it mad. Yeah. yeah. So, right, uh, a great night. Thank you, John. Yes, you spoken. I again, Mono Fortuna. I love that song. The oh, song like was it? great. Yeah, I listened to it. 
It was fantastic. It's about great friendship and, you know, fighting the world and right. two guys up against the world. And it was like that for for a long time with us, Michael. I hate you. you know? And uh, if, it, you know, you know what? I just want to say one thing. Um, if you believe in something and you care about something, you're going to protect that no matter what. No matter what the consequences are. And there's got to be something in your life or anybody's life that you got to hold dear and say, you know what? Fuck this. I don't care what happens. If anybody hurts one of mine, I'm going to hurt them. And there's got to be something in your life that you hold that dear. And that I held that dear. Like my family, Michael, you know, the people I knew on the street, I held that dear. And I'm sure Michael understands that because he was the same exact way. You know, and he and Michael Jr., my brother was right. He's a good man, a very good man. Appreciate that, John. All right. Thank and you guys enjoy the rest of your show, man. Congrats. I'm happy for you. 10,000. We'll get another one. All right. Another 10,000. <laughs> All right. Take care, Take guys. Care, yep. Ciao. Ciao. All right. Um, see if anybody else wants to pop in, guys. I dropped the uh, I dropped the link in the uh, in the chat. So anyone that wants to come in, just click on it. It'll bring you right in. You're welcome to come in and ask Michael a question or introduce yourself. Um, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to ask Michael some questions from the chat. Got a bunch of them here. I've been trying to go over why everyone was talking. Um, all right, Michael, you ready? Oh yeah. All right. Question number Lightning round? Sure. Let's call it that. I got, a, uh, I got over 20 here sitting here so far. <laughs> Question number one. Here we go. Um, Michael, do you miss Brooklyn? I miss the old Brooklyn. The Brooklyn ain't the same anymore. It's not even close. You know, the culture, the culture has changed greatly. Uh, sure. but, you know, I was born in Brooklyn. That's my roots. And uh, wherever anybody is born, they're never supposed to forget about it. And I'll never forget Brooklyn. But it's not the same anymore. Who is your Mount Rushmore? Babe Brute. <laughs> He's on there. <laughs> okay. Well, that's an odd question, but a good question. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, you... mm. That's a tough one. You know, if I'm going to pick uh, outside. I would pick all sport figures. Huh? Okay. All right, I'll get back to that one. Let me think about it as we're going on. All right. Um... You like Babe Ruth, though? Really? The best play in the history of the game, no matter what. Nobody's come close. If you if you put the stats of what he did then yeah. compared to whole, team, whole teams, he had 60 home runs. He's beat like three or four teams combined in home runs. So there's no there's no figure you could ever compare to him uh, in any era compared to what the numbers he put up against others, his peers. Uh, he has been great baseball players, absolutely. Uh, Hank Aaron. Yeah, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays is, you know, there's so many great ball players. Uh, Don Manley, you know, never made the hall. It's been great guys uh, and great uh, uh, ambassadors of the game. But Babe Ruth is, as, as the, is the only player that separates himself from not only a player, but whole teams in their numbers. So he's, he's, he's the best ever. This question here, this is a good question. Let me answer it first, then you go, Michael. Mikey, have you ever thought about getting your own show? I'm guessing that's for you, Michael. Now, before we started our show, I told Michael probably 10 times, you don't need me, Michael. <laughs> but he has a theory on why he needs me. And I'll let him answer that. <laughs> Well, I like I like somebody 
that I could bounce off of. It's more interactive when somebody has a personality, can ask you a question, not just to take this piece of paper, rehearse it like a scripted show, because what do you just get out there and just ramble? I like somebody to keep me in my place and, and have quality questions that I don't know. I like to be asked questions I don't know. I like to think. I like to think fast. And um, it keeps me on my feet. And it's good exercise for my mind. But uh, I like to interact with people. And uh, it's not about uh, eating the whole pie for myself. Manja tropa sai safuga. Eat too much, you choke. My Senate writes Sicilians out there. Uh, but no, I like the interaction with, some, with, with a host or friend. Uh, it means a lot to, uh, to I think, to the, to the dynamics of the show. You don't get bored of somebody sitting in a chair and just going on and rambling and going on and going on. I, to me, that's boring. I don't want to listen to anybody like that. Yeah. Um, now, it's possible that this question was for Mikey Jr. I don't know, but because it could be phrased either way. So, Mikey Jr., have you ever thought about starting your own show? <laughs> yeah, we get kicked off. <laughs> that's funny. Wow, that's an inside. That's an inside one there. I like that. <laughs> um, there was a good question that I seen for Brad Larkin. If you want to get to it later on, I might have it in this list yeah. here. Was, um, let's see, Mikey, do you talk to any of the old associates? Oh, can't really. <laughs> it's yes, but uh, I'm not going to get into yeah, yeah, who and what, whatever. Of course, yeah. John's on there. He was an associate. There you go. So yes, yeah. you do. We had an associate on the show tonight. Yeah, a lot Thomas of people. I see you in the background. We'll bring you in here shortly. True. A lot. A lot of people have come on through, like we stated in the past. Through the, uh, through the chat and through everything else, through emails and phone calls. They've come on through RJ. Yeah, very refreshing. Um, it's, a, it was a, it's a great feeling having that. Uh, does Michael have any stories about Jimmy Brown or Joe Francolino? Yes, I texted you. I uh, commented back to you. Sure. They'll come. They'll, they will come. Jimmy Brown was a... Uh, Huge figure uh, in that in that life, brilliant mind, pure cosa nostra, uh, tough man to deal with, and other families stuck to his gun, and um, very interesting stories about Jimmy. We could talk about Jimmy. Joe Francolino, uh, I think he recently passed away in the last couple of years. Um, good guy. Where tens and tens of millions of dollars with property in Manhattan uh, in the garbage business with Joe, uh, Jimmy Brown. And I think we're going to talk about Joe Francolino and Jimmy Brown a little bit in the tapes uh, from the Raven Eye coming up the next uh, tomorrow. They'll probably we'll be talking about them tomorrow. So stay tuned, Pasta Plate. Pa yep. Pate, Pasta Pate. <laughs> um, have you ever heard of Eddie the Blonde? Got knocked the rust off with that one. I think I did. Eddie the Blonde. There's a lot of the Blondes, but uh, Eddie the Blonde? Not sure. You gotta give me a little more. Okay. Uh, Tony H., thank you for this uh, channel donation. Uh, Tony H.'s question is, great content. Michael, did you ever travel to New Haven to visit the Connecticut wise guys on your way to Foxwood. They're all of Foxwoods. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the tape, those gentlemen that you're watching on the screen are working on uh, converting those tapes. Uh, of course, there's no voice on them. They're just videos. They're not audio. They were taking a surveillance from the uh, casino uh, uh, floor. Uh, give you a little hint on what happened there. There was a CI that was involved with the Connecticut guys that alerted them that was with us in the Connecticut party that we met up there. And they alerted the government to uh, our attending there. And uh, yeah, sure, the Connecticut guys were there. All good guys. Very good guys. Well, 
What is your relationship with Gotti Jr. now? Are you in touch? No, we're not in touch. Um, I don't have a relationship right now. The relationship I left off was in the courtroom. Uh, anything after that, uh, I'd be amenable to speaking to him. Uh, but I, I have nothing against John, and hopefully he has nothing against me. We know what went on, and I think John's mindset may be a little bit different today than it was those days in the courtroom uh, when he was on trial. So uh, I would wish him and his family the best. His son's my godchild, and uh, I wish him the best also. He's doing very, very well with the MMA stuff. So uh, I rule for him. Good answer. Um. Let's see. Uh, hello, gentlemen. I have a question for Michael. I lived in Georgia for decades and remember the Gold Club. Can you tell us about your role in that case? Well, it was like a uh, sausage roll in that case, what they did to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really didn't belong in the case, but uh, the government down there through. Uh, uh, the mob in a character like myself to sex up the case because it was really a, it should have been a state prostitution case that really should have went nowhere in itself anyway. But uh, the case involved more political aspects of martyr. Martyr was the transit system down there who wanted Stevie's property. Uh, they made some complaints. They tried to get Stevie to sell it. He wouldn't. Stevie Kaplan talking about the owner of the Gold Club. It led to some investigations to try to get him jammed up. Uh, with the dancers, they talked about prostitution. I'm standing here today telling the truth. Stevie wasn't a pimp, and he didn't pimp off no girls. That's for sure. For girls, a stripper, a dancer, and uh, and uh, Patrick Ewing walks in, Jeff George walks in, or hundreds and hundreds of uh, other uh, notable play uh, people, actors, actresses, uh, sports figures. King of Denmark was there. He went, He was almost subpoenaed. He was almost. He, I think they refused the subpoena. So a lot went on. They tried to make it a prostitution case, uh, interstate prostitution. It fell on its face. Uh, and uh, that's why they dragged me down there. I was superseded or added into the case later on when they, Stevie wouldn't give up. And the kid fought the case with 16 other defendants in it. I have some great stories. I have a video. Also, all news clippings that uh, we could put on uh, one day when we start talking about the Gold Club. Very, very funny stories. Should be made into a movie. It was hysterical, the things that went on in that courtroom. I had a great time. Uh, was laughter every day. Stressful environment, of course, but we made the best of it. And uh, like I said, it really should be a movie we'll put on in that court. The judge was fantastic. He was straight as an arrow. Gave you the law. Uh, great gentleman, and uh, I had a lot of fun. I was told I could be the mayor of uh, Atlanta if I beat the case. They said, Why don't you run for mayor? How long did that case go on for? It went off for a while, right? Oh, yeah, I was arrested, uh, I think it was September of 2000, and by the time I finished up, it was um, past the summer, right. Yeah, it was August, August 30th of 2001. Yeah, August 30th, 2001 is where I was on trial. Over. It was the biggest case in the country at one time because of the athletes. We were on ESPN almost every night. There was news from all over the country there every, every day. It was the funniest thing. Andrew Jones testified. Patrick Ewing testified. Eric Bischoff testified. There was the other athletes uh, were scheduled to testify or did testify. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Great experience. I had uh, all the leather jackets. Remember, there was about three or four of them? Yeah. I gave, them, them? I gave oh. them all away. Wow. I was handing them out one day to everybody. Yeah. Oh, they were wow. too, big at me. Yeah, too big on me at the time. So. Yeah, they'd, be, they'd be worth a few shekels today. I'm sure they, was, they were they well were, made. All, yeah, well made. They were all leather. Stevie did everything first class. Yeah, they, those were well made jackets. Yeah. He ran a hell of a business. He didn't deserve what they did to him. For whatever reason, Sammy said it's unlikely he would ever do content with Mikey. Oh, 
that's not a question. Sorry. I thought he was asking for, okay, well, maybe there's a question. For whatever reason, why did Sammy say it's unlikely he would do any content with you? I'm younger than him. <laughs> better looking than him. Better looking. <laughs> um, I don't know. That That's a question to post him. I'll, look, I, I, I get that a lot on, on the comments when I sit with him, with Michael or anyone else. Um, as long as it's respectful and it's going to be probative and people are going to learn something. Uh, yeah. Sit with anybody. I don't care. I have, I have nothing to hide. Uh, I have everything to add, not to hide, but I love a good debate. Anybody who knows me out there. I love a good debate. Me so, too. Okay, <laughs> bring it. I won many debates in college. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. I would love to have all, talk with all those guys at some point. Um, we, Michael said it best, as long as it's respectful. The backdrop of this channel is we're trying to, we have a, our, this is a channel that's for gentlemen, people that know how to carry themselves diplomatically, people that can express their frustrations, their anger, their high emotions in a, in a calm, collected way. I think any two people can have those type of discussions, no matter who they are. So. That's true. Uh, just to add, we're shutting out the women, RJ. You said gentlemen. We have a gentle lot. women. Gentle women and gentlemen. Right. <laughs> Some really good questions. That's a good point. That's true. The women, they see the world differently. You're very, very true. Um, let's see. Michael, Mikey, who owns 198 Jamaica Avenue? No clue. Um, I think there was a second part to that. Oh, right here. Oh, wait a minute. Got right it. here. Uh, Mikey, who owns 198 Jamaica Avenue? Did John Gotti own, did Gotti own this? Well, I don't know if, if that's the address, but if it's the property, I think Eddie Lino owned it at one time, if it, that's the one I'm thinking about. Then Junior bought it after Eddie, Eddie was murdered. Um, I think he opened a glass shop there. Well, it was a glass shop. I'm not sure. If that's, I'm just guessing. Uh, I remember something about that. Have you and Sammy talked since you have been on YouTube? Negative. Um, let's see here. I can answer this one. We think they're all gentlemen. Next question. <laughs> Whomever um, they may be. What? Whomever they may be. Whomever they may be. We talk about everything prior to 2002. Um, and not anybody that we have no, that Michael has no information on because he's not there. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you keep in contact with anyone you used to work, do business with? We're working in my street life. Uh, you can't I mean, come on. Say that. Yeah. Oh, Stephen, thank you uh, for the question. Give me another one, Stephen. Come on, throw another one. That one's yeah. That was like, <laughs> you know, I can't. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, I got one for you. Answer that one, then I got one for you. Good. I have a question. How are killers like Tommy Karate? And Scarpa and Castle allowed to operate for so long before they are brought down. It can't be just the money. That 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 is a great question. Tommy Karate, he was very useful. I would not put him with Scarpa and Castle at all. At all. Uh, no matter how Tommy is viewed. Um Tommy did what he had to do when he had to do it. Uh, did he have some personal stuff he did on the side uh, hurting people? He did, uh, but do not put in with Scarper and Castle, that's for sure. Uh, those other two guys, yeah, and we're going to talk about those two guys and how they got away, from, away with it for so long that they should not have. Uh, I do have strong opinions about that, so uh. Then you could again, if you want to throw in that other guy in Philadelphia, you can squeeze his name in there too, because it's all one and the same. Yeah. I don't let him go. He's not getting off the hook, RJ. 
<laughs> and I, I, had, I had I didn't know those guys in Philly. But you know my feelings. And I said this. When I was in that life, if you on the other, if you in Italy, that was my brother if they were part of this life. My feelings and my opinions about what was going on was still strong on them hurting guys over power and money and greed or whatever their motives were. So the guys in Philly, I felt bad for him uh, with this. They think he was killing everybody. It was a terrible thing. So yeah, Tom, always, you're off the hook. <laughs> yeah, I always say this. Uh, you know, my bring up, I've talked about, I've had uh, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of phone calls and conversations with Michael about former guys in their life. And there's only three of them. He's he has a, a opinion on that he thinks you know a little a little hard on everybody else. He can find a reason. <laughs> he can find the find something good about him. Nikki Scarfo is one of them. <laughs> hey yeah. Mikey, what, hey Mikey, what was yeah. the question that you wanted to ask? Oh, um, <clears throat> you and I spoke about it the other day a little bit, but I figured I'd bring it up again. Uh, who and if you did, was your most formidable opponent with sit downs? Oh. Good question. And if it was rematches and trilogies and whatever it is. Who was the best? A Wild Bill was up there. We went at it. We had a, a worthy adversary relationship. Respected him highly. But we, we, had, we had some good ones. Um, one had to be adjudicated with Alley Boy sitting there. Uh and which was, we came to, I'll, I'll explain that story when they had to do with uh, uh, Chris from uh, Miami. And uh, I'll tell that story. Well, it's a nice little tidbit to tell. Uh, Ali was a great guy and a great administrator, uh, a great boss up there. Um, good man, good life, inside and out. But uh, I would say Bill was good. Now you're talking about the best at sitting down. Yeah, I guess in general, I guess. Yeah. Uh, one of the best guys you could ever sit down with or against is Paulie Zach. Jimmy Brown was dynamite. I never had a real beat. I had a couple of incidents with Jimmy uh, that I'll explain. He just opened up the he opened up the box again. Yeah, you got Jimmy, Jimmy Brown story. Really good. Really good. Yep. Um, I, would, I would say on the outside as an adversarial would be uh, Wild Bill. I sat down with TG many times. Uh, another time I could tell this story to a great one and open up some eyes about uh, how politics are so devious in that life where your own guys give you up in beefs and sit downs where they should must be standing next to you. They stand on the other side, literally. Uh, so Sally Vitale was involved, Tony Graziano, TG, uh, one of the funniest guys around, but a liar. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, I respected him as a friend, and he played his games. Uh, but TG, because he just didn't give an inch, he just lied. Um, let's see here. So this guy restated his question: Who is your mob, Mount Rushmore? Oh. Well, you definitely have to put Chin up there. Frank Costello. Yeah, I put him on there. Oh, I, I, without a doubt. And um, for old times' sake, I got to put Dagula for what he did and controlled the whole country at that time. He had uh, every family until they went to war in his pocket just about and had this massive network from coast to coast, north to south, east to west. Uh, I ran the family. I think he got at least a decade run. I can say maybe a long, maybe 15, 16 year run he got, which is which is astonishing for that, that those days when everybody was killing each other. Uh, but putting that network together and keeping everybody tight and setting up all these uh, messages going all over the country, I would have to say him, Chad, and Costello. There's others. I mean, there's plenty of other guys. I mean, uh, you would yeah. How can you put your? How could you put your Carlo Gambino on there? <laughs> He, he was, he was, everything was in place for Carl. Good point. Yeah, they, they, point. They, had, they had stuff already going on, but Chin, Chin, the way he ran his family was outstanding, and Costello was 
Costello was uh, Marlon Brando and the Godfather to me. May not be to some others' opinions, but uh, Frank Costello was the the guy that that, that controlled a lot of people, judges, politicians, etc. He's a he was more of a politician. And he should never got that break of getting maybe attempted sass assassinated. Good question. Vito Genovese, that was Vito who wanted power. But uh, but you know, man died free. He did it. He stepped down when it, when power was coming down. He saw the big picture. He was a very wise guy. I always say that's he's a definition of a gangster's paradise. He's on my Rushmore. I, I'd say him, Luciano. Um, I always go back and forth between Giuseppe Morello and Dagula because they were both like right there at that founding period. Who won? Things up. Who won? <laughs> well, Dagula won. You're right. Good point. Okay. I'm going Dagula now. I'm changing yes. my answer. I'm going Dagula. That's but right. A lot of people don't give no credit to the founding guys. And those were the guys that really set this whole thing. What Gambino, like you just said, what Gambino could sit on, what Anastasia could sit on. Um, Chin Giganti and all these guys that, you know, that, you know, Carlos Marcello and these guys, they sat on the, a stool that was built by, right. by guys that really organized it. The biggest fallacy ever that's really popularized in this genre is that it all started in 1931 with Lucky Luciano. It's just not true. Right. There's guys that go way back that were forming and, the guys who really fought the war, you know, that fought to to put the thing in place. Hundred percent. Right. Hey, Mikey, what's your Rushmore? I never even thought about it. Okay. <laughs> you give me a couple of minutes. I'm looking at the questions here. There's a couple of good ones. If you see yeah. anyone to ask, ask them, Mike. Yeah, ask one, Mike. Throw it up. All right. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm still looking. Okay. Um, this is a good question because. <laughs> Mikey, did New York guys refer to Chicago guys as Cosa Nostra? Because um, it seems like they didn't use the name there. Um, this is good. I'm glad someone asked this question because, you know, bad information coming out by creators has really took Chicago just completely out as if they were just the blood to the Crips. But go ahead, Mikey. What, Michael? <laughs> well, what I find more interesting about this question is uh, what his statement is. Cheers. From a Brit in Romania. Oh, okay. Hey, welcome in Romania. Right? Very good. Yeah. That's an old place in the world. I love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, and I'm sorry. I, before I before you go, they also donated five dollars to the uh, channel. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Not necessary. Uh, but but thank you. Um, uh, you know, I've heard mostly outfit growing up. But it was Cosa Nostra. You know, it was Cosa Nostra. You, you know, the, but they, a lot of people referred to it generically uh, as as the outfit. That was a typical. Even my father would say, the, those are guys in Chicago, the outfit guys. But it, it was Cosa Nostra when you talk to the purists and the, the you know, some of the other guys. Uh, uh, you know, there was guys that came to the club one day. Uh, for, about gambling with the, the Chicos and everybody else robbing the casinos out there. And they came to Chicago, Chicago guys came. They were wise guys. They came. They were going to come to Spiro's Club. Uh, I was told to stick around just in case things broke bad. Uh, we were going to give them a beating, <laughs> send them back. But if they, if they came with the wrong attitude, I guess. Uh, but no, they were coaching us guys. They were made guys. I was told they were made guys. Absolutely. And and outfit was just an, another generic term that was more widely used back during that time. Luciano used to refer to his group as an outfit, the Luciano outfit. You know, he, he would talk to people and say, hey, me and my outfit, you know, it was, it was like gang or clan, you know, right. be, you know, outfit, gang, clan. These were words that were used, you know, at a time before uh, before family became more more popularized. But, you know, it's just it's like saying the West Side guys. It doesn't mean that they're not Costa Nostra. It's a nickname right. for it. Right? Great example. Yeah. Or Duxus guys. Yeah. Other guys. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But they, you're right. There were there were certain terms for for, for the guys that are towards the Midwest. Yeah. Got a question, Mikey? Mm, I seen a question with Bobby Boriello here, but I don't know if you want to hold off on that one. It was a good one. Um, Let's see. 
Jim Fuller. Jim Fuller. He's a Patreon member. Thank you, Jim. Um, let's see. I have a long list here, so I got to, like, make my way through it. Um, but let me see. Uh, Carmine S. Uh, also donated to the channel $5. His question is, uh, Mikey, did you know anyone from Jersey? Oh, yeah, I know Jersey guys very well. Sure. You want to elaborate for him? Yeah, <laughs> Anthony Rotundo. Yeah, oh, for, for oh okay. Him. Yeah, Anthony Rotundo, Philly. Uh, I know Anthony Capo, drug problem. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of those guys. That's um, where Anthony Capo was with the license plate, right? Yeah. Was, was one, of the, one of the kids that won that hit, I think, used his wife's license plate. Took it off Anthony's car and put it on the stolen car. That's something out of a movie. Yeah, bad movie. License, license plate at the scene of a, at a murder. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have any interactions with Joe Corey? Absolutely. Great man. Great man. Joe, uh, old time guy, very sharp. Um, a guy, if I had to, would have confided in him at, at any time. Well, I have a couple of stories with Joe that I could share down the road. Uh, pure, pure, Cosa Nostra, old school, not a violent guy. Violence would have been the last thing he resorted to. Money guy had some unions um, and knew the life inside out. His father was a wise guy, he was a captain. Utsu uh, Megiddo, they used to call and, uh, him. And his father, his great grandfather, was a wise guy. They go right back to the, the, the founding of this life. Um, Those are the teachers. That was a teacher. Joe Hill. Did you have any, I mean, who was Norman DuPont and what was his role in the family and associate, and who was he associated with? Well, he took care of the Ravenite. Uh, uh, I like Norman. Norman did something very, very stupid. They killed an innocent guy. He's in jail for life. Uh, they killed an innocent guy because somebody else owed money in the car service. So they set an example. I think it was three of them all together when they just shot the dispatch or somebody was in the in the car uh, the car service. And um, he did a real stupid thing. He's paying for it with his life. And the other guy don't have a life. So um, Norman was a good guy until I heard that, that he killed the guy for no reason. Would Jackie Knowles have made a good permanent boss? No. No disrespect to Jack, of course. Yeah. Jackie would have never wanted that role, ever. He never would have wanted the responsibility and everything that came with it. Jackie was not a violent guy. He was, uh, Jackie was a great captain, regardless of what happened in the past with John. I will straighten that out as to why all this stuff went on with Jack. Uh, Jack was a good guy. Uh, I'm not going to say he was a fish out of water when he first became a captain, uh, but he was surrounded by sharks. I try to put it like that. And uh, Jackie was too nice a guy. Uh, Jackie was a true friend to uh, John Senior. I said this before. I think John Senior. Ah, well, I'm gonna say I know John Senior. Realized that later on, and so did Junior. Uh, but Jackie, no, he would not have been a good boss. No, he 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 wouldn't have wanted it. Can I? And you don't have to answer this. I don't know if you want to talk about it or not. But because this, this is after 2002, but th there was and I. There was suspicions at a time that he was the boss. No way. Yeah, and I, okay. I just wanted to, I don't know if you want to talk about it on camera or not because I know you didn't really believe that. I'll give my opinion. No way. I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna say no way. Yeah. I don't think he I mean, never would. Or acting boss, whatever. But at a time that yeah, that's the suspicion that he was leading the family at a time. But not for Jack. Yeah. And not um, even Jack would say it. Yeah. Now. Just one more to follow up on that. You, you think that he could have made a good consigliere? Yeah. Think so? Okay. We'll think. Those diplomatic guys usually work good in the consigliere role, I guess. He was a yeah. great liaison to go talk to people and other families. 
And that's yeah. that's my point of, of that position is somebody who has rapport, uh, somebody who shows deference, somebody who uh, could smile when they sit down, not sit there with a hard face. And yeah. you're gonna deal with it. You're gonna deal with a person that's hard headed and stubborn, and you want to deal with a negotiator. So yeah, Jack would have been that would have been a good spot for him also. This is a good question here. And hey, Mikey, if you see any questions that you're looking at that you want to just inter add in, just go in and ask them. Okay. But hey, I want to ask you this question, Michael. Here, this is, this is a good one from Kate Lacey. Hello, Kate, one of our you know uh, major supporters here. Um, Michael, if you could go back to your old life for one day, who would you spend that day with, and why? My Dead or alive? My mother. <laughs> okay. We're just talking about having a time machine and going back to my mother and make up some things that uh, should spend a little more time with her. Uh, but it, on a more serious note, I guess in the street, it would be uh, probably Paulie Zach. Oh, wow. Good answer. Or Jerry. Or Paulie. Well, that's a good answer. I thought you were going to say senior. <laughs> um, uh, this is a good one. Um, any reason precluding your father from being made? Oh, yeah. My grandfather held him back from the late 20s until when Carl took over. My father had a very, very bad temper. And uh, he would have got killed. I probably wouldn't have been born. I would have been happy for somebody who's going to say, yeah, good. He should have been made and got killed. But uh, put that aside, yeah, no, my father, very, very bad temper. And uh, he went in the last day. He got killed. My grandfather held him back. Lucky Luciano asked for him early on, was a young man. His, my grandfather's answer to a Lucky was they killed his, uh, his godfather. Nobody gets my, my son. Then later on, Carl had asked, my father, called Gambino, and my he told him, no, he's not for the life. My father, we got. I found out later on, my father was very angry with my grandfather for that. But he saved his life. You know, he, he didn't realize it. Don't don't you have a good story about? Um, I know I've seen pictures where your father had to go to Italy when he was a boy. Oh yeah, yeah. Because they were going to kill him. Yeah, I got to tell that story. That was when they were at war. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'll tell that story. It's a great story. I have some pictures uh, I can add in. Uh, where they, they, my grandfather left them there for, for months at a time, then came back to the States. They tried to kidnap my father. So I don't want to give away too much, but that's that's a good point. Um, it's, good, it's a great story. Um, this is interesting question here. This is different. That's, and that's worth it. It's a good one, I guess. Uh, Michael, what would happen if a made guy put his hands on an associate like Joe Watts as far as protocol? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like that. Uh, I'll tell you what. I was in a bar one night with Joe. I was in uh, Pastels. And the guy, there's a couple of people out there listening this probably know this story. Guy came over to him, drunk and this and that. Uh, you know, really scrappy guy, big guy, and uh, drunk. And uh, he was bothering Joey. And Joey put his hand out, like, leave it alone. I got this. He tells the guy, you hit me, I shoot you. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you hit me, I shoot you. Now, if it went to a beef, uh, Joe Watts would say, okay. Because he would lose. If it's a, what did you say? Made guy, right? Made guy. Yeah, it would, it would be all right. They would have an argument. The made guys are going to count over Joe Watts. But I guarantee you, little time, they'd say, what happened to that guy? Here we go. <laughs> and, everybody, and guys that know Joe Watts would say, I think he got an apartment in Staten Island now. <laughs> and they say, I just appeared. What happened to him? Where'd he go? I, I don't know. Where the fuck did he go? Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> so you're taking the position. Yeah. Joe Watts would have clipped him and put him in a fucking hole. Excuse my language. So you're taking the position, essentially, that a non-made outsider 
German, non-Italian, Welch, had the ability, was so powerful that he had the ability to get a made guy killed. No, I didn't say get a made guy killed. I said he would kill him. Oh, well. He wouldn't go for permission. That ain't happening. He would have waited a year, two years, three years, five years. And the guy was just not coming around anymore. He wouldn't. I didn't say he was going to go for permission. Oh, I got you. I got you. Let me put now, if he knows Joey, now fighting the street, that Joey would have told him just like he told that guy, you know, you touch, you hit me, I shoot you. The guy walked away. Now, now, based on protocol, Joe Watts got to die for, for that. Yeah, you got to catch him. <laughs> you ain't gonna catch him. <laughs> it's a good question. I'm glad they asked that. That was a good one. Tricky. Um, now, Joe Watts he came home from jail. I'm sure he's a good boy right now. And he's, he's not doing anything criminal anymore. I, I'm sure he's just relaxed and chilling out, spending some money. Going up yeah. to the and eating some really fancy restaurants. <laughs> when the Gaudis put you on the shelf, why didn't they take you out? If the Gaudis thought you were taking from the top, the next step should be killed interested in what you think. I don't really understand that, Cordy. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Oh, okay. okay. I, got it. I got you, King. Good, <laughs> hand, good hang, Leonidas. Um, well, first of all, I was in prison when they did that. I beat my Atlanta case in uh, August 30th, 2001. By June 20th, I was arrested again. I was only out for several months. Half a year, nine months, whatever the hell it is. Uh, so when I went in, is that's when they started these these false accusations that I was robbing from the family. Uh, so they didn't have access to kill me at that time. Uh, and, and that was one of my questions. I was in the street all this time. Why didn't do anything then? Why didn't anything, anybody question me then? You felt I strongly robbed something or did something that egregious? Why didn't you kill me then? I said this question openly in the courtroom. So, uh, yeah, they, they, didn't, they did not have access to me to do something like that. Um, and that's it. They did the, the cowardly thing, and they, they broke me in prison for no reason. What was your first thought when you found out the indictments were coming down on you? Well, I knew, in, in going back to the Atlanta case, uh, I knew they were coming. I was supposed to be arrested with Junior in the Scores case. They were going to try to throw me, lump me in there with Jackie, John, the Connecticut guys, and a whole bunch of other figures, Greg the Palmer, uh, the son, etc. cetera. Um, we knew. I was going at the lawyer's office all the time. I had my lawyer talking to the prosecutor up there saying, you know, whenever you're ready for Michael to turn himself in. So we knew that indictment was coming. The judge had said no more superseding. In other words, no, you can't put anybody else in this case. Let's get the case going already. So they left me out. They wanted me to plea out pre-indictment, which we told them, go pound sand. And uh, next thing I know, after doing this case, I was arrested in Atlanta. And I had a feeling it was coming down there. I was getting some information and some surveillance stuff that uh, we may get, uh, I may get arrested there. So we hung around, did the same thing, went back up. My lawyer and said, You want Michael to turn himself in? Which what I did. I turned myself into Atlanta. I brought myself down here with my lawyer. Did Tommy Gambino ever show any animosity after Paul was whacked? I know he wasn't a street guy, but even any subtle signs, I always wondered about that dynamic. No way, no how. Um what was your favorite restaurant in Manhattan? Oh, I had a lot of them. Billy Hong's? For Chinese food, very good. That's the best ever. Nobody comes close. You can say Mr. Chow's. They can say, do you want to pay a high price? That's Mr. Chow's. Billy Hong was the best by far. Lobster roll, nobody came close. To this day. Yeah, it was great. Uh, Italian restaurants, I like I like Tarabina. Tarabina at one point, that was Joe Butch's place. That's tremendous food. 
Um, there was a place called Marco's uptown. It was a Danny Marino hangout. Uh, kid was guy was with him. Had very good food. Uh, I like Morton Steakhouse. Morton was, it was a huge hangout for us. I had many meetings up there. Well, we had many meetings up there at Morton Steakhouse. Uh, I, lo I love that. Uh, give a shout out to Cipriani. Cipriani's. Great stuff. High end stuff. Uh, really good. Just, you just about going anywhere in Manhattan. There's so many great restaurants I can mention. I, I can't say one except for the Chinese place, Michael said, because I don't eat Chinese food. I would only eat it there. Padre was another good spot. You just keep going. What comes to your mind when I mention Club A? Oh. Club A. Who, who asked that? Oh, all right. Uh, I see that guy over there. I think I, I, you post on here a lot, Vincent. Vincent, yeah, Vincent, you post on here a lot. Club A was all the money guys. That was Regines, Maxime's, and Club A. Those are the top end clubs where dignitaries would go, princes, and gangsters. They didn't mix very well. Uh, but Club A was a deep place to be at that time before it closed down. It became scores later on. Uh, that's where Scores was located. But Cl Club A was, you got guys dancing on the dance floor, guns would be falling on the floor. <laughs> There'd be actresses, queens, uh, princesses in the place. There'd be all kinds of people in there. Uh, funny stuff. Um, let's see. Were you close to Steve Kaplan? There's two. Which one? I know both of them very well. Steve Kaplan, Gold Club. I was very, very... Junior had put him with me after Barry Boriello was killed. Uh, very, very close with Steve. Steve is a great guy. Uh, classy kid. Knew all the ball plays, basketball, football, everything like that. Had Mikey there. Took the Mikey to the camp, basketball camp. Right? And then Anthony Mason gave you the, the basketball hoop. Uh, yeah, no, Steve is a great guy. Stevie Kaplan, very friendly with uh, John Junior. That uh, classic photo of uh, Boriello Jr., myself, and Steve, the other guy in there, Steve Kaplan, very close with Jr. Uh, but the other Steve Kaplan from the Gold Club, but he's a great guy, great, great family, good man. Um, if Joe Watts was Italian, how far up in rank would you think he would have made it to? Captain or boss? Oh, he definitely would have been a captain. But that's no question. He would have been in administration. I don't know about boss, but uh, who are you gonna who are you gonna take out of the boss position? Uh but yeah, he would have been an administration guy. Probably on the boss. He was a suited for both yeah. He would have been, I don't want to say that. He he could have been, but he was, more suitable for an underboss. In your experience, what is the worst flaw of character in that life? And what is the best quality? Oh, another. That's easy. The worst flaw is greed, envy. Those are the worst. Those are the guys you got to watch out for. Because uh, old time, they want to take your place. Backstab. Those are the guys. They smile in your face. Uh, greed and envy. Because that leads to power. That leads to their, their uh, the thoughts of power. Because you're in their way. They, if you didn't have anything, they couldn't be uh, envious of you. You have to have something that they don't have, or a position they don't have. They have to have a personality you don't. They don't have. You have to have it, and you may be in their way. And that's that's what's bad about that life. Uh, the best quality, is compassion. Hmm. Have the ability to be compassionate, pragmatic. Uh, there's certain qualities you would need. Listen, not everybody dies. Not everybody dies in jail. Not everybody goes to jail. You had a guy like they said, Joe Corey. He had some run. His father had some run. It's how you conduct yourself, how you comport yourself. Uh, and these guys were captains and lasted that long. He didn't die jail, die free men. Died an old man, probably 90 years old. There's plenty of guys. There's a guy out there right now, he's probably 100, still alive. 
nondescript fellow. Never did a day in jail, I think. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's character. It's, 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 a, it's a great question. Um, I think it's the second great question he threw up. Yeah, but that, that, that if you have those, if you can have a balance of how you are, because you can't show weakness either. You know, you give, you, you can't be compassionate and give in. You, you have to have, you have to be assertive. You know, there's, there's a combination of, if you want to succeed in that life, there's plenty of guys as tough as could be. Yeah, the cemetery's full of them. How fast do you want to go? You know, how fast do you want to go? Cemetery's what are your aspirations? You know? <laughs> Cemetery's full of them. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, what was the best score you ever did that was fun and you made a lot of money? Stock market. It was free. I just it was just brought to me in boxes. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun spending it even more and gambling it. As soon as I got money, I said, get, where's my suit? I'm getting to Manhattan. <laughs> so, uh, you know, take everybody you know, go there and have dinners. Was the Baltimore faction still a thing under the under Gotti during your time? Uh, no, not that I know of. But there was some, a little bit of connections, uh, probably in the 80s with Joe Gallo when he was handling the Baltimore crew. Uh, later on, maybe just a little bit, but not nothing with nothing. Nothing under me for sure. What's the most gruesome thing you witnessed in your life? My friends getting killed by my friends. All right, we'll take a few more questions here. We're getting, it's been a while. Um, uh, Michael, have you ever traveled to the town your family was from? No, close. No, I never made it there. I guess in another life, I'll make it there. Um, have you had any dealings with Whitey Bulger? Negative. Um, hey, Mike, did you know Tough Tony? Yes, I did. Good question. Because I know he just recently passed. Uh, it, it was the real name was Tony Parkside. Uh, John would make fun of him. He'd say, Tough Tony? Who's this Tough Tony? And he was friendly with him. He liked, he liked Tony. But he, he would never ever call him Tough Tony. He would never call anybody tough. <laughs> he was Tony Parkside. But the guy was a classy, classy guy. He was a Manhattan guy all the way. I went to his club. He had a club in, the, in Manhattan. Uh, Rage? Rouge? Rouge? Rouge, I think it was. No. I got to think of it. But he had a great club in Manhattan. The guy was a classy guy. Talk about a dresser. He's up there. Classy dresser. Very mm. good. And he was good with his uh, neighborhood. He did a lot of good things uh, for his, the people of his neighborhood. He came from a poor neighborhood, Corona, Queens. And um, he did a lot of work with those people to help them out, rents and food and et cetera. West Side guy, let me add, he was a Genovese family guy. He wasn't in our family. So I'll make a distinction that uh, wasn't somebody I interacted with. What's the difference between a made guy and an associate? Uh, a big difference. Just what it said. Made guy, you made it. <laughs> Some guys fake it till they make it. <laughs> but a uh, made guy and associate is a huge difference. There is no comparison. Uh, and you take a guy like Joe Watts, he's maybe the exception to the rule. But as far as everybody else, you're, you're just property of, of a made guy. So I think this might be someone who might be new to the genre. Some people, I've met people like this who they're learning and they don't know. So if you're asking about the difference in rank, a, a made guy is a member of Costa Nostra and an associate is a connected guy. Maybe you might call him a connected guy, a guy who's on record with somebody. Uh, he might be working with a member, but he's not, um, he might be, but he's not a member of the organization. Um, it's almost like in that movie Goodfellas when they're saying, you know, to be made is the highest honor they can give you. It means you belong to a family and, and you know, so in a brotherhood. And so a, a made guy, if you're asking what the what they mean, made guy is a guy who's a member of the society 
bounded by blood and oath of omerta, whereas an associate is not. Fair? Yeah, and, and a made guy could sit with other people that are inducted members where associate cannot unless they make an exception and have him sit down in a conversation or, or beef or uh, negotiations. Uh, they could always be excused because they're, they're really, they don't count unless you make them count. Uh, they're not part of that society and not uh, supposed to even really acknowledge that the guy you with is made, even though it's, it's a lie. But uh, everybody knows. But uh, yes, he has no voice as far as any uh, um, authority or power or influence. He can only influence and talk to his guy, which would be a made guy. Yeah, the only benefit that might be to an associate, and I've studied guys who have said this, where they didn't really want to be made because, you know, when you're an associate, a connected guy, you're not on, you can kind of, you have a little bit more flexibility where you can just do what you live your life and you're not on. And Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when once you're made, you're put into a crew. You have to answer to someone. You got to show up every day. You got to, you know, but associate kind of, and kind of have a little bit more. Well, there's, two, there's different types of associates. I could have a, uh, a, a guy that owns a deli. Yeah, that guy's. Or, I, or, or uh, a deli or a florist or a shoe store, anything. I could have a guy who owns a construction company uh, that there's an associate of mine, but not have anything with mob activities. Then you have an associate that wants to get up in the life and be a made guy and is willing to commit crimes. There's a different type of associates. Yeah, well, Michael was that. Yeah, my, like my son is my associate. Doesn't mean he has. He could be a college kid and be a doctor. He's my associate. He's associated with me. Nobody's going to bother him because of who I am, my, my position, what I am, I should say, not even who I am. But uh, a guy that's in the street, it it, it 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 carries a different responsibility because as a made guy, you're responsible for that guy in total of what he does. If he's want to come up the ladder and be in that life. So you're responsible for that guy. Yeah. Michael was once asked, uh, what is the difference before he was asked this? And he said, you know, well, they asked him what's the biggest change when, by being made. And his answer was, it's like having, you know, it's like you have a whole, like a whole army behind you. You got the whole, it's like having a license. You got you have the whole army. That was your answer, I think you said, Michael. Yeah. It's like it's like having a license. You got the and, and you have a whole you, and you have a whole army behind you, right? So you have the protection of the whole organization that stands behind you now. It's like being in a union almost. And then yeah. something happens. You you have a, you have people who represent you. To right. if you get jammed up in something, mm -hmm. right? And your protection of what you are. When you get made, that uh, other members can't uh, abuse you and uh, lay their hands on you. It's one of the rules. You can't lay your hands on, on somebody that's made. Um, all right. Well, we got through a lot of the questions. Any dealing with the Westies, Michael? Yeah. Not the Westies you think about. There's other Westies, and that will be. Probably that tape from the Ravenite. They come up. So we'll talk about that in the Patreon uh, explanation of the Ravenite tapes. Before I answer this last thing, I want to show this one here. Michael, again, as far as protocol, how to explain Maddie Madonna said to the Bonanos that Lucchese's wouldn't recognize their boss because he was in jail when Vicka Musso has been in jail forever. You know what? I can't certify that statement because I don't. I, I never heard it before. I have no clue. Uh, theoretically, that's that. Uh, that can't happen. Your boss of your family is your boss of your family, and no matter where he is, until he steps down. So I don't. I don't know if that's a true statement. I don't know where he came from. So it's not a fair question. It's a good question, but it's not a fair question for me to answer. Um, so this is Kate Lacey's asking about, I'm thinking Brian Jr. And yeah, the reason, um, I'll leave, I'll leave this as a last, I got an email from Grind yesterday 
And I'm not going to put her business out because she's, I don't know that that's okay uh, with her, but Grind's having some health complications. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge Grind um, that uh, we, we um, you, uh, you've been a long supporter of mine since the beginning of my first channel. You've been with Michael and I the whole way through this channel for la since we started. I uh, wish you hope your health improves. Um, I will ask Grind if it's okay for me to say something. Maybe we can do some kind of donation thing for her or something. I don't know if she needs help with me medical stuff. Maybe we can do a show where we all the benefits go to her. I'll talk to Grind about this. Um, but yeah, Grind's having uh, some complications, but we, we wish uh, Grind well. Um, Rhonda is her, is her actual name. She's okay with me saying that, but her name is Rhonda. She's, she's probably watching us, I'd imagine. Um, but uh, Rhonda, if you're watching, we wish you well, and I uh, hope you, you know, uh, make a full recovery. Yes, for sure. So, guys, uh, thank you. This is, um, again, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm more than, uh, if I had the ability to give, you know, all 10,000 people a hug, I would give it to you. I just can't do it. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you. We appreciate you guys uh, being there, being loyal supporters, which is different than, you know, I always say a view and a supporter. They're very different. Um, if you click on a video for 30 seconds, that counts as a view. Um, we got people who are supportive of our channel. They they reach out. They send emails. They send DMs. They hit. They contact me on Twitter, on Instagram, on uh, TikTok, on everything that we're on Facebook. Um, they send emails. They send phone calls. They send what they WhatsApp me. We uh, this channel. You guys have been. I, I, I'll never be able to thank you enough. So thank you for helping us get to our first milestone. We're going to continue to give you guys good content. We're going to continue to stay out of any drama. We're going to continue to be a positive channel. We're going to continue to be a place that you can always come here. You can laugh a lot. You'll smile a lot. And when the show's over, you won't feel like you were just in a fight. So that's the place. This is a place that you can come to for that. Um, so thank you. Um, I appreciate you, and I'll let Michael close it out here. Wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Be healthy. Rhonda, shout out to you if you get better. Um, and just keep it coming. Thank you again. Thank you, guys.